Okay, my friends, this is going to be fun. This is Sabine Hossenfelder, and she's talking about muons and how they are trying to understand them. Well, I can show you muons, and I do understand them. Okay, here's another part. Matt Farrell, undecided with Matt Farrell, and they can't understand about this fusion. Well, they've, there's a new means to do it, which is with the lasers, like we're doing it. Now watch. Complicated and boil it down to where my little brain can understand it. Essentially, bang, instant fusion. This take on... That's exactly what we did. Bang, instant fusion. And, well, actually it's fission and then back to fusion instantly. Fusion has a number of advantages. First, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. First of all, they are using hydrogen and pulsing it with lasers to break it apart. We don't have to do that. We just use light. Watch. Okay, these are the smallest particles that exist. CERN and Fermilab agree there's a fixed particle and there's a point particle. Here they are right here. These are the point particles, is the glowy one. The fixed particle is literally dark matter and gravity. There it is. This is the photon, which has a field that surrounds it. That's why it bounces off things and you see it as light. An electron is only half of these. They stick to you. They will stick to you and you will, you will attract them on dry days when they won't have uh, moisture in the air to attract to. They will jump onto your body and then you'll touch a water pipe and snap. All the particles will flow to ground because they're excess on you. This right here is exactly what they want to do, is to break these apart, which is called fission. And then back to here, which is fusion. We did it. We're using the muon neutrino, the black one, and the white one is the electron neutrino. When they come to our venturi, which only allows the white through, the black has to separate. So we did fission to break them apart, and then we did fusion to put them back together. And here's where it happens, right here. Acceleration, because of the venturi. Fission, because the slit is not big enough. Fusion, because they have to come back together. They normally are always together. As I showed you, there's the muon, and there's the electron neutrino. It's exactly what Fermilab says. And they fill space. Empty space isn't empty. It's filled with this quantum foam, which is these particles, which are particles of light. Okay, this is going to be pretty interesting. This is Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it's called Star Talk, and how a star is born, and how life is propagated explode, right yes yes and but then this is what got me when you said that and then that is what when these elements go out into the universe and they seed stellar nurseries and you know and they start this process again and i'm just like how does that even happen like mm -hmm. how does the process itself then get kick-started you know um, okay, so uh, so a couple of things. Let me come into that from a back door. Okay. So if you take biology class, and one of, every biology class will spend some amount of time trying to define life. Yeah. All right, I'm, this is far enough that we have to go. So let's take a look. What is the life that we expect to see on here on Earth, and why have we missed so much? And I'll show you what they have missed. Okay, so have we missed life? Well, I say absolutely, because this right here is a gigantic fish that is on Earth. It's in the desert. It's right above the eye of the Sahara, and everything drained out into the ocean as the eye of the Sahara collapsed during, apparently, this event when this fish was attacked by this gigantic dragon. Now, if you want to laugh about this, go ahead and laugh. This was written about in Apollodorus. This is Typhon. It said his head was so high up it brushed the stars. He runs all the way from here to there. That's where his fluty little tail is at the end. These are dragon scales right here and they are the toughest looking scales I've ever seen of anything. Give it a second to home in. When you see these, look at these plates. Look at these different colors. And these different plates. This is this is biology on steroids. Something created this almost impenetrable 
maze of scales. This is runoff of effluent that's decaying from this dragon's body. All the way up this side, at the other end, is his head. And the same thing here. This is all runoff from the decaying body above the surface of the earth. This is not buried. This did not happen that long ago. This is his red flary eye and is all of this. This is his head right here. This is the neck. This is the flashy looking stuff they have on the parades in China. I have shown this hundreds, literally hundreds of times. I have never had one response from any academic to ask any questions whatsoever. This was the cut across that dragon's throat. These are the scales of his throat. These are the dragon scales on his throat. If you think those are just accidental, then you got some issues with the way you think. This is the throat right here. That's the cut. And it said, Zeus cut his throat with his great and mighty sword. Something was great and mighty that cut that throat. These are dragon scales. And that's that cut throat. And this is where blood is still issuing from this thing because blood makes things grow green as can be. In the middle of the desert, we got some serious amount of green going on. Right from that gash in its throat. All this red and black is blood. That's just blood running out. He, he bled out in the desert. And there's his body. Runs all the way across North Africa. And all the way over here is the, actually has feathers on his tail. You see these? These are like feathery looking things on his tail. That's not dragon scales anymore. These are basically feathers. They had some strange creatures back then. And this is shown exactly in the, the uh, map from, I think it was, well, let's look at it. I think it's 1375. But the dragon is killing the fish. And the fish, you can see his body. You can see actually the blood vessels and everything. It ate away at his whole skin. You see this coming down? He spit out all this stuff and got, went down about this far on a fish. And here it ate through the upper layers of the fish's body, and we can see his blood vessels. These, those are blood vessels. These are arteries. Those are capillaries. Uh, those are um, blood vessels, and the tips are the capillaries right at the bottom. You see, these are blood vessels uh, that run down to the capillaries, and the capillaries transfer the blood into the veins. Let's look at right here. You see this? This is all artery blood coming down. It branches off and ends up getting back into the veins. Now any doctor that looks at this will understand what they're looking at. If they don't, they shouldn't be practicing medicine. This is the way blood vessels transfer oxygen and nutrients to the body. Now it ate down to about here from that incursion by this dragon. Now, if they want to talk about life and all this stuff and ignore every single thing that's been put in front of them, that's the key is going on here. We are being misled by people that just ignore anything they don't want to acknowledge. They just, eh, it just doesn't exist. That's what academia has become. It's become a system of denial. Okay, so my contention is that academia has become a complete system of denial. If you go in there and you start asking about defining life, let's define life. What about God and, and the ancient text? They would laugh at you and destroy your life for bringing that up. That's the society we live in right now. You are slaves and forced to say precisely what you, they tell you to say, or they will ruin your life and keep your money. And if you don't go to their colleges, they will destroy your life by telling everybody you're stupid and you can't, you can't learn from them. That's, that's the system we live in now. I'm going to change that. We're going to make free education, or at least education, affordable. And we're going to give both sides of the equation. We're going to talk about what the ancient text said, and then what is visible today. And you will find out that we are completely misled. Okay, my friends, it's time to get into the really serious end of this research that I've been doing. Not that it's not serious 
just knowing the reality of things, but it's serious in the fact of what was written in history and <clears throat> what can we support. What is supported now by the material evidence that I've been showing you right along? Well, we know there was giants, huge giants, the kind that they talked about that nobody would ever even think to be possible, miles tall. We know there was dragons that were just exactly what they said. The head scraped the stars, Typhon, whose throat was cut in the desert. There's many, many things that are corroborated by the evidence that we can see. It's supported by material evidence, not just theory. Now, my hero, Emanuel Velikovsky, back in 1950, wrote a book called Worlds in Collision. And at that time, there was a cataclysm on the earth that caused a great flood that everybody knows about it. You know, where did it come from? When did it happen? Who, what caused it? Well, he found out all the ancient texts, every single culture there was, wrote the same story. There was a huge fiery comet that almost hit Earth and combusted the skies and the forest and boiled the waters and killed all these giants. They were just, just the, big, the biggest ones died, all of them, basically. And then there was some smaller ones that carried on, but, and then there was the normal little people that seemed to, they got by somehow. They're here now, so I'm not sure I can buy exactly the Noah's Flood story that there was only eight people that populated the whole world. It's possible. I can't discount that 100%, but I find it very hard to believe, especially if all these documents existed. But anyway, what else can we look at? Well, Moses. He goes back to this exact same time. Moses was from the ruling God at that time, and here's your laws. All right. Now, what time was that? Nobody really knows. He says, what was the date of Moses? It says, the biblical Hebrews, these are the Jewish people, the Jews, Israelites, they had been in Egypt for generations. They were there for a very long time. But apparently they became a threat. So one of the pharaohs enslaved them. Now they don't know who it was. It says the personal name of the king is not given. And scholars have disagreed as to his identity and hence as the date of the events around Moses. Now, one theory takes literally the statement in Kings 1, 1 Kings 6.1 that the exodus from Egypt occurred 480 years before Solomon began building the temple in Jerusalem. That This occurred in the fourth year of his reign, about 960 B.C. Therefore, exodus would be about 1440 B.C. And Velikovsky puts it in the 1500, uh, 3,500 years ago, approximately. So it falls right almost exactly in the right time frame. And he says the Israelites, the Israelites, the Jews, escaped during this turmoil of this cataclysm. They escaped. And whether or not the flood and all that damage was brought about so they could escape, I don't know. Was it brought about by God to deliver them from their enslavement? I don't know. But from what Velikovsky says, they did get away, and the Pharaoh's guys were, were pretty well decimated by all of the things that happened, the floods, the stones falling from the skies. There was just tons and tons of debris coming out of the skies. And there's a lot to this story about the birth of Venus from the feared god Jupiter to make retribution on the earth for these giants, to cleanse the earth of that particular offspring that had mated with the, the angels. So it's, that's what the story is, and I see no reason now to discount it.